Abdul Hakim Shabazz, a local troublemaker. It's, mis it's Mr. Troublemaker to you, sir. Always correcting me. <laughs> nothing changes. He is the editor of IndiePolitics.org. Tell us a little bit about the event tonight. Uh, well, this is a conversation uh, between former Governor Mitch Daniels and now Purdue President uh, with Gary Johnson, Libertarian candidate uh, for President. The governor has always been a firm believer that more voices are good, you know, particularly for the national dialogue, you know, national discussion. He's not getting in the middle of the political campaign season, but here's an opportunity for you know, folks here in you know, central Indiana to get a chance to actually you know, see a presidential candidate up close you know, and ask questions in a very informal setting. It looks like about a thousand people have come out. It's not just libertarians. I know all 40 libertarians in the audience. The rest of them, it looks like a very diverse audience. So we even have one uh, former state lawmaker here in the audience. Several candidates. So it looks like Gary Johnson appeals to not just libertarians, but a broad stretch of the yeah, population. If you look at the fact that Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are both have high negatives, one in the mid-high 50s, other one in the mid-60s. I mean, that ought to tell you something, that the American people are just kind of clamoring, you know, for something new, something different. And I don't know necessarily whether Mr. Johnson or Governor Johnson will be successful in his presidential campaign, but definitely people are tired of, you know, sort of business as usual and sort of, you know, going, almost sort of going retro, you know, politics with Trump and Clinton because it's, you know, this party like it's 1995 all over again with these guys. Do you think that Governor Daniels, the former governor, now president of Purdue, holding this event, is that a bit of a stick in the eye to the Republican establishment and the Trump campaign? Not really, because Mitch Daniels has always said, you know, if Donald Trump, sure, if Donald Trump were to say, Governor Daniels, I'd love to come to Purdue, or Hillary Clinton, the governor would be gracious in inviting them to come and sit on the stage, you know, and interact with the public. So I don't think it's a thumb in any, anybody's eye, if anything. You know, this is what, I believe the phrase is, this is what democracy looks like. All right, thanks. You can check out Abdul at anypolitics.org. I know you have a final word for us, Abdul. Hey. The only, the only voice that vote is one you don't cast, particularly for someone you don't like. Here with Joe Houtman. He is the state director for the Johnson Well campaign and also sometimes the state chair of the Libertarian Party of Indiana. You have been in the Libertarian Party since how long? 79. 79. So to see a crowd of, I would say, about a thousand people show up to see one of our presidential candidates, hosted by a former governor of Indiana, a Republican, and who sits on the debate commission, what does that mean to you in this election cycle? It means that people are finally willing to look to some choice other than the two establishment legacy parties. Does it cause excitement for you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it, especially when I know that the, this crowd is just a fraction of the people actually watching the event due to live streaming. The internet really is responsible for a lot of this. Absolutely, absolutely. Orson Welles got it, to, uh, got it totally wrong in terms of what computers and the internet would do. It has probably kept us freer. Um, that little uh, lens on your camera has done more to uh, free people around the world than anything we've done in the party. Tell us about the organization in a state like Indiana. The organization, a state like Indiana, uh, is mainly virtual. We do have a physical office at uh, 6371 Guilford Avenue in Broad Ripple in Indianapolis. But most of the work is done on uh, basically smartphones. Uh, we have apps available where basically people sign up. They can go anywhere in the country, really, literally, turn on their phone, and they can canvas houses for us and the data goes right into our uh, computers directly so we know who to contact on election day. All right, thanks very much, Joe. Thank you. Here it is. Hi, Chris. The We Are oh, Libertarians yeah. Troublemakers. Little you know Brett it. Bittner mm -hmm. Hi, and Ro Floppin' Rob Kendall. Floppin' Rob. <laughs> hey, hey, I just have my big board backstage. I saw you had your, your tiny, excruciatingly small board. board. The governor and I had a great conversation. It was so wonderful. I told him how great he was. Which and, governor? Uh, uh, governor Gary Johnson. All right, okay. He uh, had a great time. <laughs> you can tune in tomorrow, WIRZ 98.9, <laughs> 7 o'clock, hear the full conversation. We talk about scaling Mount Everest, about uh, being so physically fit. Uh, you know, those sorts of questions, he's not going to get anywhere else. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I don't even know what to say after all that. Why, why, how did he get in here? He's this a guy, Republican. Everyone I don't loves know. me. 
Correct. <laughs> now, oh, no, I barely got in, so I don't know how he got in. All right, here, Rob Kendall. Here's a, no, wait a second. Here's the story I have for you. This is the right. story. Uh, apparently, the uh, Johnson, Trump, and uh, Clinton campaign were in some group thing together where they were all getting along. And they actually said, if Hillary's going to do an interview in Indiana, it should be with Rob Kendall, because he's so fair. He's so great. And yes. I think she should do that. I th do you believe that the three campaigns communicate in a Facebook group? Ask Lee. He heard the story. It was a great oh, interview. Yeah. Well, I wasn't yeah. here about yeah. He's, yeah. he's yeah. way too handsome to yeah, be a libertarian. Right. He's, he's a Republican, right? Uh, no, he's even wearing colors. colors. Oh, all right, colors. okay. Yeah. I'll take it. A new, a new breed of libertarian. I it's not it. like uh, old and haggard like oh, us. Yeah, no, we have the ties and we're dressed well and we look good but in all seriousness governor and johnson Rob. so charming he was so great <laughs> you and, didn't uh, ask him what aleppo is uh, did you uh, no i did oh, not we had right. no aleppo conversation oh, all right all right i'm gonna go take my seat bring it back when you're done uh, let me start with the question i'm really most interested in what's harder the iron man or climbing mount everest <laughs> You know, I, I do think that life is, uh, they're the same. One foot in front of the other, and that's the lives that we all live. I do think that um, anything that can go wrong uh, will go wrong, and it's something that we should just all plan on. And it's how we deal with uh, adversity uh, that ultimately determines success. So just plan on anything that can go wrong, will go wrong, um, for a lot of people, that's curling up in a ball and saying, I'm a victim and I give up. But for me, and I think for all of us, we just need to get a smile on our face and get after it tomorrow. So I'm the get a smile on your face and get after it tomorrow guy. Even if it's 29,000 feet above sea level. Even if it's 29,000 right. feet uh, above uh, sea level, yeah. Uh, Governor, can we just start? Uh, would you just give the crowd a, a, a brief synopsis of your philosophy, the, the one that has led you to, uh, into public life or that you operated by, and the one that led you to this candidacy? Well, I, I think right now that <clears throat> Bill, we first of all, Bill Weld and I are on the ballot in all 50 states. There's no other. <laughs> yeah. Nobody else can lay claim to that. And I think that we're speaking on behalf of the majority of Americans. I think we're speaking on behalf of 60% of Americans when I say the following, that we are fiscally responsible, uh, that we're for smaller government, that when government taxes you or I, that's money that we could be spending on our lives as opposed to government telling us how to live our lives. We're socially inclusive. Um, that means that I think all of us want the freedom and liberty to make choices in our own lives, period, as long as those choices don't put others in harm's way. I'd also add to that that I think the majority of Americans right now are skeptical of our military interventions, that we inv when we involve ourselves in regime change, uh, that things have worked out worse, uh, not better, and without exception in my lifetime, I can't think of a single example uh, of it ever working out. And then lastly, and this may take a bit of a sales pitch, but uh, I do believe that free trade is what most of us, or that what we really want. And free trade is not crony capitalism. Free trade is absent of government interference. Pay to play is government interfering itself in the market. So we're the only free trade candidates uh, in this race also. So All right. there it is. Let's, let's try uh, what I'll, I'll call a sort of a lightning round. You have a very interesting combination of views, a little different than the, the candidates we've uh, uh, come to know in the, in the two major parties. Uh, can we go th quickly through a, uh, just give a short answer and then the audience is invited to press you or to, to drill in on them in more detail. You, you just surfaced uh, the first one, so let me just double check. Uh, should we have intervened in Afghanistan? Uh, by intervened in Afghanistan, we were attacked, we attacked back. I supported Afghanistan. But after seven months of being in Afghanistan, we wiped out Al-Qaeda. We should have gotten out after seven months. I think we should get out tomorrow. And the consequences of getting out tomorrow will be the same as the consequences if we get out 20 years from now. 
and I think that we can more than mitigate that situation tomorrow. Same answer for Iraq? No. Uh, with regard to Iraq, um, I said at the time, we have the military surveillance capability to see Iraq roll out any weapons of mass destruction, and if they do that, we can deal with it if, in fact, that happens. So um, I was against the invasion of Iraq. Hey, uh, <laughs> Assyria? That's where that Aleppo is. Aleppo, <laughs> Thank you. He invited me to say something about Aleppo. I want that. Syria is regime change, and I oppose regime change. So Aleppo, at the epicenter of what's happening uh, in Syria, and please, if I'm wrong on any of this, follow up with your question, but let's see, we've got the eastern side of Aleppo, which is um, uh, the Syrian regime, Assad, and they are fighting the free Syrian army, which we support, but they're allied with Islamists that we don't support. And so we arm, so we arm the Free Syrian Army, and those arms end up in the, um, in the uh, Islamist hands. And then we've got uh, Raqqa to the north, which is ISIS, which was really uh, created when we invaded Iraq and all of Saddam's henchmen fled to that area, and ISIS was a term, of course, we didn't even hear until a couple of years ago. But we're supporting the Kurds against ISIS, but the Kurds are sideways with our ally Turkey, who isn't such a good ally anymore because we invaded Iraq in the first place. Are you getting just how complicated this becomes when you get involved in a civil war? And as horrible as these situations are, because we got involved in this because the situation was horrible, look how much worse it has become. And I have said now for months that the only way we're going to find ourselves getting out of Syria is to join hands with Russia diplomatically to make this happen. So I applaud Secretary Kerry and the fact that, um, that this may come about, but um, look, we're going to support the Free Syrian Army, and then the Free Syrian Army now is going to turn and fight against those that, have, that it has been fighting with, arm in arm. And we paid, this is a lot more than just a few seconds here. Well. <laughs> but we paid uh, Assad at one point, we supported Assad to fight the Islamists. We did that with Bush. It gets more and more complicated, but we're gonna this, is what I would, this is what I would pledge to avoid. We're going to mark you down as skeptical. <laughs> Drug legalization. We should legalize marijuana. In 1999... <laughs> In 1999, I was the highest elected official in the United States to call for the legalization of marijuana. We have tens of millions of Americans who are convicted felons that but for our drug laws would otherwise be tax-paying, law-abiding citizens. I believe, I believe, and I have only advocated the legalization of marijuana, and this is since 99, but I do believe that when we legalize marijuana, we're going to come to a quantum leap in understanding. And that understanding is going to start with looking at the drug issue first as a health issue rather than a criminal justice issue. The right to bear arms. I support the right to bear arms, period. We should be open to a discussion and a debate on how we keep firearms out of the hands of the mentally ill. We should be open to a debate and a discussion on how we keep guns out of the hands of would-be terrorists. 
As President of the United States, I would love to know what transpired between the FBI and the shooter in Orlando, given that obviously the system worked up to a certain point, but then broke down. Energy subsidies. Uh, I'm opposed to energy subsidies. Uh, if, uh, if you just look at um, um, ethanol as an example, I, I, believe it costs, uh, I believe it costs more or takes more energy to produce ethanol than it produces. Now, the problem with energy subsidies are is that, you know, you point at the good, but then you also have to point along with the bad, and energy subsidies under a Johnson administration would be administered 100% correctly, but at some point um, I'm going to leave office. And I do say that facetiously also. Depending on the person in office, um, it may be a good thing, but if you allow for subsidies in the first place, which is a distortion of the marketplace, um, where, where do you draw those lines? And it might work with a particular a given administration, but then it doesn't work with the next administration. The death penalty. As governor of New Mexico, I reversed myself on the death penalty. I always thought that, uh, that, well, I do still believe in an eye for an eye. But what I came to recognize is, is that the error rate on the death penalty may be as high as 4%. I don't want to put one innocent person to death to punish 999 that are guilty, much less four to death that when it were 96 are guilty. When I was governor of New Mexico, uh, Governor Ryan from Illinois ordered a review of 36 inmates on death row. And because of DNA testing, they were able to categorically prove that over 20 of them were innocent and they were released from prison. This is flawed public policy. It, it costs more to put a person on death row than it does to lock them up for the rest of their lives because of the attorney fees involved in the appeals. But when you find out that someone is innocent and released because of those appeals, because of the work by the attorney, what price do you put on that? There, it's priceless. So let's finish uh, on a subject that you were dealing with uh, a long time ago as a border state governor, immigration. <sighs> we, we should embrace immigration. We are a country of immigrants. I am speaking as a border state governor, and I will tell you that this whole immigration uh, issue with regard to Mexico is a political boogeyman. It doesn't exist. They are cream of the crop when it comes to workers. The reason why there are 11 million undocumented workers in this country is because the government has made it impossible to get a work visa to come and take jobs that U.S. citizens don't want. We should... We should make it as easy as possible for anybody that wants to come into this country and work to be able to get a work visa, and a work visa should entail a background check and a social security card that applicable taxes get paid. Building a wall across the border is just uh, crazy. Wharton School of Business, let's see, Wharton School of Business, that's where Trump got his uh, degree. <clears throat> came out with an analysis of uh, economic impact of restricting immigration. It would have a negative impact on our economy. Uh, they came out with an analysis of let's increase work visas um, for high-skilled workers. That would have a small positive impact on the economy. Uh, let's dramatically increase immigration. That would have a very positive effect on the economy. Let's not forget that these are hard-working people who are buying homes, cars, food, clothing. They are contributing uh, to welfare, uh, Medicaid, uh, Medicare. They're contributing to our Social Security in this country. 
um, it, it's a good thing. Let me just go a step. Just to go one step further, uh, you've been quoted as saying that economic freedom requires the unrestricted movement of people as well as capital across borders. Now, that's a pretty ex expansive statement. Um, are there some qualifiers on that? On the work visa, that it should entail a background check because we don't want criminals coming into this country and a social security card so that uh, taxes uh, do get paid. But if the government is in charge of quotas, quotas don't work. No quotas. There, there will either be jobs or there won't be jobs. And right now, there are more, uh, there's a migration occurring into Mexico because right now there are more jobs in Mexico and there's a 12 year low in immigration coming over uh, uh, from Mexico into this country right now. <clears throat> So I've got a couple more uh, questions that'll take a couple minutes, I suspect, for the governor to address, but it's not too soon for any of you who are uh, moved to do so to uh, come to the mics, and as I see people there, we'll, we'll make the switch. Um, you have called for uh, another rather bold proposal, a 20% reduction in defense spending. Um, and. Um, you know, some would observe defense spending is now at the lowest levels of percentage of the economy, just over three that it's ever been, and that inside of that, a lot of it is now consumed with health care and things that don't directly um, uh, defend the uh, United States. Are you sure that you could bring off a 20 percent reduction and still promise Americans they were safe? Well, uh, first of all, um, I've heard those same statistics that here it is, we are at this multi-decade low or decade low when it comes to funding the military and come to find out it's just not the case. But I will tell you that it's out there and that it's prominent, but it's not the case. Look, um, we should have an invincible national defense. Um, and I... There have been two polls now in the last six weeks among active military personnel, and I am their choice for President of the United States. <laughs> On top of those things that I mentioned earlier with regard to policy, uh, balancing the federal budget, I think, is important for all of you. So Bill Weld and I are making the commitment that in the first 100 days, we will provide a balanced budget to Congress. Now, <clears throat> Congress has to act on that, uh, but we will give them the template for how that gets accomplished. You cannot balance the federal budget unless Medicaid Medicare uh, is reformed, and we have our ideas regarding that. You can't balance, Social Security is a whole nother matter, but it's simple compared to Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, but with regard to military spending, notice I didn't use the term defense, I said military spending. The BRAC Commission uh, uh, instigated in the mid 90s to determine base closures in this country recommended that 25% more U.S. bases could have been closed. This was the Pentagon itself with their commission. We would in, reinstitute BRAC. Look, we're not going to cut the military um, uh, and sacrifice military supremacy. We are spending more money on our military, as much money on our military as the rest of the world combined. Do we really need to, nuclear weapon-wise, be able to blow up the world 20 times over? You know, might 16 do the trick? I, I'm just, uh, maybe so, maybe so. And then, of course, I want to thank our guests, and I, I just have to leave you with this observation. Sir, you, you just gave uh, several, uh, in fact, uh, a string of, uh, uh, intelligent, candid, uh, politically risky, unpredictable, 
uh, answers, all apparently grounded in a consistent philosophy. What are you doing in this election? <laughs> it's not that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Governor Gary Johnson. Thanks oh, to each man. of you. Oh, that was great. That was great. Now that we've finished the uh, Gary Johnson event with Mitch Daniels, what were your impressions of Gary Johnson's performance tonight? Well, I thought uh, Governor Johnson did extremely well, uh, like I said, engaging the crowd, you know, sharing his ideas. I thought the, the governor, former Governor Daniels, said it best. It was, you know, consistent, intellectual, and also risky. And, you know, what are you doing in a presidential race? So the, I think Gary Johnson did extremely well. The, the only catch is, you know, can you do this for the, for the millions of people that you need to get you into the debates, which then, you know, possibly catapults you to a you know, real fighting chance of winning the presidency? Chances of Gary Johnson making the debates? Um, as the governor was saying, probably not the first one, but as things you know, develop and go on, it wouldn't be shocked if we made the second or third one. Also, please keep in mind that this 15% number is relatively new. Ross Perot got in the presidential debates back in 1992 with only 8% you know, uh, polling. So it's, it's, it's not like this 15% is a hard and fast rule that's been around forever. All right, thanks, Abdul. Oh, go ahead. Oh, do I have a, okay. Uh, do you find the majority of Gary's appeal to be that he's not Hillary or Trump, or is there something compelling that draws you to Gary? Well, but I, but I've always liked governors. I've always had a passion for governors because governors have actually managed something. They balance budgets. They've dealt with legislatures. They've dealt with infrastructure, roads, and bridges. You know, you have state police. You have child welfare. So uh, I've always had an inclination toward governors. And Governor Johnson just happens to be the only governor in this race, which for somebody like me makes him extremely appealing. Also, the fact you know I see Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump on a party like it's 1995 all over again. You know, kind of been there, kind of done that. Is there an appeal in the fact that he ha he will be able to get more done, as uh, since he has a different governing framework by being sharing issues with both sides? Well, you, you still got to deal with Congress. You you still have to deal with Republicans and, and Democrats. And it's been a while since we had sort of this trilateral type government. Say so you got a president. Yeah, say so you got a president of one party and Congress of maybe two different parties when all is, is said and done. But there's no reason why the governor's experience, you know, working with the New Mexico legislature, you know, he can't take that and use that to work with Congress as well. Is there a particular policy position he takes that you find most appealing or you think would be most appealing to a general electorate? Well, like I said, I just like the fact that governors have actually managed something. They've balanced budgets. And you know what? Not everything necessarily needs to become a law. You don't necessarily have to sign everything. Now, there are a couple of things I you know, tend to differ with the governor on on some of the interventionist stuff. But, you know, heck, my wife doesn't agree with me 100 percent of the time. And she's the second smartest person I know. <laughs> um, let's see. Do you want to ask who the first is? Because I can tell you, <laughs> it's Abdul. It's me. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be good. Uh, right, my name is BJ Gilhausen. Now, you are a former Yale student, right? Yep. YL, Young Americans for Liberty, and you uh, are Facebook friends of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've been one of the people that has been kind of critical of Gary Johnson. I have a little been. bit, little bit skeptical. Can you talk about your Johnson skepticism? So my main issues with Gary uh, is his stance on uh, I don't think he doesn't recognize life begins at conception, which I, I believe it does. Um, so that's kind of been my biggest my biggest complaint with Johnson. And then also um, as uh, I, I believe the religious liberty is uh, the religious liberty. Um, is really important, and I don't think he understands all the complexities that surrounds that. But I'm with I'm with Gary on everything else. I love the fact that he said that he's going to focus on balancing the budget within his first hundred days in office and get the beans counted. I don't believe that Hillary or Trump are going to do any of that. So that's kind of you know, if, on that basis, I would support Gary over Hillary or Trump. And so, what did you think of his answer on religious liberty tonight? Because. I look at it and I say that's a very balanced answer, you know, I'm not going, there's been justification using religious liberty for discrimination in the past, and we have to be careful with that. Do you disagree with that? So yes, I do believe that um, I, I am wary of discrimination, uh, especially with, with uh, gays, lesbians, trans, uh, transgendered folks. Um, but I think a lot of, the, there's also the other side of the token where um, you, the government, like, there's a lot of religious organizations that employ workers, and um, to have somebody who doesn't comply with your, your, your beliefs, say like if uh, like in a Catholic organization having a Protestant come in, uh, they wouldn't subscribe to the authority of the Catholic Church, it would create an issue there. 
So on the base, that, that would be a basis of discrimination the Catholic Church would take in their hiring and making sure that they have Catholics working for them. Um, and also with Protestants, um, you know, if you, don't, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ as, as your personal Lord and Savior, you wouldn't necessarily want to um, have uh, someone who's uh, of Muslim or Jewish descent or a belief in your organization also. So it, it's really super complicated. Um, and uh, I think he kind of doesn't understand the complexities because it is so uh, complicated and he's got other things that he's, he's worried about. But that, those have been, uh, that's like the other side of the, to of the token. So after seeing him in person, hearing him talk for over an hour tonight, did it change anything for you in terms of your opinion of Gary Johnson? So I was, I'm, I'm kind of in between Daryl Castle and Gary Johnson right now. I, Trump or Hillary is not even a factor for me. Um, so um, now it's, for me, it's kind of electability, viability, and all that. And I think, um, you know, given the fact that Gary's, um, I'm, I'm more of economically minded and worried about our budget and spending and uh, running away with our federal deficit. And um, I, I would be more apt to vote for Gary after coming to him and seeing him tonight. Um, solely on the fact that you know he's going to get our fiscal house in order, and that's his first priority of business. Which uh, if we're going to get the state out of our lives. We need to focus on that. He also once said he's going to do a 20% uh, spending cut across the board, uh, try to decrease government involvement, and, um, and help encourage entrepreneurship, which is what our economy needs. Uh, so based on economy and viability, uh, that's where my support of Gary Johnson is coming from. Uh, I'm Anthony Shuckle. I'm Megan Hedesheimer. I'm Sarah Bischoff. I'm Michael Seekin. Are you guys college students here at Purdue? Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, are you involved in any campus groups? Uh, yes, we're members of Young Americans for Liberty. Awesome. Okay. They know Creighton. They, they know Creighton? Yes. They know Creighton. Oh, yes. okay. Well, this will be a really hard interview then. Uh, <laughs> so, are you guys fans of Gary Johnson? Or were you, were you, sometimes there are libertarians that are skeptical of Gary Johnson. Mm -hmm. uh, BJ being one, uh, we just talked to BJ. Uh, did you guys come in to this event skeptical of Gary Johnson and his campaign? Uh, personally, uh, me, no, not really. Um, I'd rather take anyone, just about, of course, over Hillary or Trump. So, I, and then, of course, I don't agree 100% with Gary Johnson, but yeah, 90% is definitely good enough for me. Anybody else? Yeah, I would say I would take, you know, the 85% or whatever I agree with Gary over the 40% or lower that I would agree with, you know, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. So it's all about, I don't want to say like picking the le lesser of three evils, I guess, but <laughs> that's kind of, I guess, what it's come to. I, yeah, I'd definitely say, I wouldn't say Gary Johnson yeah, is, I wouldn't say he's is like an, an, an evil, evil but it's just that he's not the perfect candidate. Not that there is say, such a thing. Yeah. What do you not necessarily agree with him on? Uh, personally, I don't agree with him on his stance on abortion. Uh, just coming from the religious background, I do. Uh, that's the like biggest thing for me. Um, that's a I've heard, from yeah, I've, yeah. And there's some other stuff, maybe just really small stuff, but other than that, that's probably just like yeah, the one big thing. Yeah, I'm also pro-life, and um, I know the whole like gay wedding cake kind of thing was kind of an issue with him. Um, I personally think that if you want to refuse service to anyone for any reason, like a business should be allowed to do that. Um, so just the fact that he would kind of push for businesses to um, do things or decorate cakes, for example, for people they don't necessarily agree with just kind of violates the whole libertarian principle for me. What did you guys think of his answer tonight on the religious liberty? He was asked about it. Mm -hmm. And he basically said that religious liberty has been used as an excuse to discriminate in the past. And certainly he's not for forcing, you know, the, the Jewish baker to bake the Nazi cake, as we all have seen in memes, of course. Uh, did, did his answer change your mind at all tonight? Uh, I don't really think it changed my mind. Like, yeah, I knew, I, I know what I believe in, I guess, you know, and of course, I'd love to support Gary Johnson, you know, for, you know, word for word of what he says, but yeah, didn't really change anything for me, I'd say. Yeah, I think that trying to make a politician change your mind on some aspect is a bit of a dangerous philosophy. Yeah. 
What is it you find most appealing about Gary? If there's a single posi- issue or position or policy stance? I think his record is being really fiscally conservative and vetoing, you know, the most bills out of all the governors combined. Fiscal policy? Yeah, fiscal policy and economic policy. Same. I would second that. His commitment to balancing the budget um, is really important to me, and how he would say he would do that in the first 100 days is, uh, means a lot. How do you feel introducing friends of yours that are inevitably uh, feeling the burn, or we're feeling the burn, to Gary Johnson? How do you introduce him? Uh, I'd say, well, one of the best ways to describe him, and I guess libertarianism in general, is it takes the best of both sides of the aisle. And what, yeah, a lot of you know Bernie fans don't realize yeah, that they do agree with you know 50% of what he says already. And if they really looked into it, you know, they might agree with even more. So is there anything where you walked in and you? You walked into the event, you thought one thing, and then you left thinking a different thing about Gary Johnson. Was there anything about Gary Johnson that surprised you? Well, I think uh, one of the things that surprised me was a bit of his joke that he has celiac disease. Well, not a joke, but his saying. That's definitely something I didn't know and a lot of people didn't know before, <laughs> but um, I guess on a more serious answer. Um, his uh, describing Aleppo and the situation in Syria contrasting from like a week or two ago when there was the uh, media uproar about this third party candidate that didn't know what Aleppo was. As everyone else did a Google search on what Aleppo was. Yes. Yeah.